I know you can't believe this is happening, Ms. Coates, but I assure you it is. I have been paid, and paid very well, to kill you. Bell Coates looked up at the intruder through a glaze of tears. Please, just tell me what you want, she said. Just tell me what you want and you can have it. Anything, anything at all. The man sighed. You're not paying attention, Ms. Coates, he said with the accentuated patience of a third-grade teacher. I am not here to bargain. I told you that. I'm here because this is what I get paid to do. But why? Why me? Bell made yet another futile attempt to stand. Her wrists and ankles were lashed to her kitchen chair by the sort of Velcro restraints she and other hospital nurses use so often on difficult patients. Those restraints look amazingly simple, the intruder said. But I tell you, they are a marvel of engineering and ergonomics. No pain, no marks, none at all. That's why I have a dozen or so sets of them in the drawer at home. The man, six foot tall and wiry, had been hiding inside Bell's apartment, probably behind the couch in the living room, when she arrived home at nearly midnight. Her nursing shift, 3 to 11 p.m., in the cardiac surgery ICU at the Central Charlotte Medical Center, had been a tough one, and she had relished every stare of the trudge that brought her closer to her apartment, a cup of tea, and a steamy shower. She was just choosing a tea when he appeared in the doorway of her kitchen, an apparition in sky-blue surgical hair and feet covers, latex gloves, black jeans, and a black long-sleeved tee. She was so fixated on his appearance that it was several seconds before she noticed the huge, gleaming knife dangling at his side. Her hesitation was more than enough. In two quick strides he was beside her, seizing a handful of her hair, snapping her head back, and pressing the blade against her throat. With just enough restraint to keep from drawing blood, he forced her down onto one of the oak chairs she had recently refinished, and in moments the restraints were on her. It had happened that fast. A dozen or so sets in the drawer. The statement was as terrifying as the knife. Was he a serial rapist? A psychotic killer? Desperately searching for even the smallest inroad to understanding the intruder, Bell tried to remain calm and remember if she had read about such a man in the papers or heard about him on the news. "'What do you want?' she said. "'My fiancé will be home any minute.' He fixed her with pale, translucent blue eyes that were devoid of even the slightest spark of humanity. "'I don't think so. We both know about your failed engagement. Celebrate Bell and Doug's love.' I'm very sorry about that. Bell froze at the words, quoted from her wedding invitation. Who are you? she managed again. What do you want from me? Now we're getting someplace. The man produced a vial from his pocket and set it on the table. I want you to swallow these sleeping pills I found in your medicine cabinet the last time I was here. I have augmented what was there with some that I brought with me tonight, so there will be more than enough to achieve our goal. But before you take these pills, I want you to copy and sign a brief note I have composed explaining your despondency and your desire not to live any more. And finally, I want you to undress, step into your tub, and go to sleep. See? Simple and absolutely painless. Bell felt her breathing stop. This couldn't be happening. She wouldn't do it. He wouldn't be able to pry her jaws apart with a crowbar. She began to hyperventilate and shake grabbing and releasing the arms of her chair. I won't do it. You will. I won't, she began screaming. I won't. I won't. Help. Somebody help me. Her words were cut off by exquisite pressure around her throat. A hard rubber ball was forced expertly between her teeth and into her mouth. The killer remained absolutely calm during the insertion. That was stupid, Miss Coates. Do anything stupid again, and you will be responsible for causing both yourself and your sister a great deal of pain. Bell stared up at him, wide-eyed. The mention of her sister was a dagger. Hyperventilating through her nose, she still could not seem to get in enough air. That's right, the man said. I know all about Jillian, just like I know all about you. Now refuse to do exactly as I say— 
try anything stupid again, and I promise both you and Jillian will die prolonged and painful deaths. Understand? I said, do you understand? Bell nodded vigorously. I'm still not certain you do. Now listen, Miss Coates, and for your sister's sake, believe me, I have no contract to kill Jillian, only you. With very rare exceptions, those I am not paid to kill, I don't kill. He took out his cell phone, made a gentle tap on the screen's touch display, and held it up for Bell to see. I assume you recognize your sister's condo in Virginia, Arlington to be exact, 489 Bristol Court to be even more exact. Nod if you agree that is the case. Good. I know how close you two are. You see, I read your journal, or diary, including entries from the trip to Nassau that Jillian took you on after you learned about Doug's, how shall I say, dalliance with your friend Margot. Surgeons. They are just so full of themselves, aren't they? I see you are having a little trouble breathing. Okay, here's the deal. I'll remove that ball. If I get your assurance, you will stay quiet and still. Bell grunted her agreement and again nodded. The man pulled the ball out, keeping his fingers clear of her teeth, and dropped it into his pocket. Now, he said, what you are about to watch is a live video feed. Live as in it's happening at 489 Bristol Court right this very instant. Bell stared in disbelief at the full-color projection. The footage was unquestionably taken from her sister's tastefully and lovingly decorated condominium. She was certain that the woman sleeping alone in the queen-size bed was Jillian, also a nurse, and one of the main reasons Bell herself had chosen the profession. Following the automobile accident deaths of their parents, Jillian had stepped in to raise her 14-year-old sister, often making major sacrifices in her personal life. Bell considered her to be the kindest, brightest, most centered person she had ever known. The camera had been placed above the valance in the bedroom. At the sight of Jillian, rolling languidly from her left side to her back, Bell began to hyperventilate again. Easy, the man warned. Slow down. That's it. That's it. Please. Please don't hurt her. The apparition holding the phone leaned forward. Bell cringed as his empty eyes came level with her own. His pale white skin was tinted blue, a ghoulish illusion cast by her ecologically friendly halogen lights. You must calm down your breathing and listen, Miss Coates. To save your sister's life and yourself from a great deal of pain, it is essential that you believe I will do as I say. I believe. I believe. Turn it off. Turn that camera off and leave her alone. I'm going to make you a promise, Miss Coates, he whispered, his lips brushing her ear. I promise that if you fail to follow my instructions, Jillian will die, and die quite horribly. Do as I say, and she lives. Want proof? Look here. He held the phone at eye level. Enough. Bell pleaded. Don't hurt her. I've placed small canisters of a potent nerve gas above the door frame inside the closet. Action almost instant. From this phone, I can control how much of the gas is released simply by tapping my finger. Incredible, yes? I am a virtuoso operating this setup. I put another camera in Jillian's bathroom because I want you to see what happens when just a smidge of this gas is inhaled. 